Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Lisa, holding a stack of documents with her hands in the air. She was very worried about the last thing left in the important case, the most important steps to the court. She had brought all the documents and evidence. Who would have thought it would end with this? And it all started a little over a year ago. Her mother Vanessa retired early, barely 50 years old. She worked as an accountant, and then she got tired. Tired of the paperwork, the taxes. She wanted to live for the soul. Her hobby was breeding violets from the fields. She had all kinds of violets, and blue lace varieties of blue ice, white bells, velvet purple and flowers decorated windowsills and racks. She didn't miss the annual flower shows and won prizes more than once. And every Saturday, she went to the post office, sending cherished parcels. Her violets were selling like hotcakes all over the state and coast, and recently her husband had been helping her with her flower farming. As it turned out, Andrew was a jack of all trades and helped her with shelves racks for flowers with special light. And so the plants grew like yeast. Vanessa laughed and often told acquaintances that they had a family business. She looked at her husband with awe and always held his elbow, now, and then we put his head on her shoulder. In general, an idol to the envy of her friends. They were married for a short time, only two years. It was Vanessa's second marriage. Her ex-husband was a military man by nature harsh and fiery. At one time he had been through Afghanistan, got a contusion. Living together became unbearable, and Vanessa filed for divorce. She was afraid for her daughter. She'd been alone for many years, pulling everything herself. And then at one of the fall exhibitions she met Andrew. He was a tall man, with a mustache and a sly smile, a little bald, but with a good sense of humor had a degree and had long worked as a teacher at a university. Andrew was 10 years younger, but just like Vanessa, he was interested in botany. They found common interests word for word, and after a couple of dates, they were suddenly married. Andrew moved in with Vanessa. Here in the old five-room apartment, they planted a flower garden and seemed to live in a garden of Eden. And one room he rented to some acquaintances, for which he received a good monthly supplement to his salary in the form of $800. Vanessa left the work on breeding, and in addition to the joy brought a good income. Her plants were popular. Daughter Vanessa was already an adult, lived separately in her apartment worked, and the happiness of the mother did not interfere. She herself graduated from the institute and found a place in the company on the recommendation of her classmates, Frank. He was still in his third year and after graduation had a good seniority. Everyone's life was going their way. But one Saturday afternoon, the phone rang. Lisa was home and quickly picked up the phone. Turned down the volume on the TV, she heard her mother's excited voice. Lisa daughter, Bug, what just happened? My heart is pounding like that. Mom, what happened? Don't be frightened, so you don't feel well. What's wrong? Lisa sat on the edge of the couch, her hands went cold. I just came back from the post office, going up to the floor, under the door, naked and dead. Well, I think he must be sick. Well, I touched his body with my shoe, and he fell out. There were threads, threads, black, huge nails sticking out. It's like it's wrapped around him. Then Vanessa breathed into the tube, and Lisa heard her mother take a sip. Apparently, she was taking Corvalol. That's awful. Who could think of such a thing? It must be springtime. The crazies are on edge. Mom, don't worry about it. Forget it. It's just a stupid or sick joke. Oh, Lisa, who makes jokes like that? My heart froze. I opened the door and jumped over the threshold without looking. I took a broom and threw it down the garbage chute. This pigeon flew down. I crossed myself and hurried home to wash my hands. I don't know what to think. Calm down. Have a cup of tea. Forget about the pigeons. You want me to come over. Lisa got up and started walking around the room figuring things out. How long will it take to get there? No need. I feel better already. Andrew will be home in an hour. 
I'll go warm up the soup. Vanessa sighed and hung up the phone. Lisa stared at the screen of her smartphone and listened to the beats. She felt uneasy too. The unpleasant discovery under her mother's door had ruined her mood. Lisa decided that she should go for a visit, but there were plans for tomorrow. She sighed at the scales in her head shaking, anxiety, and the desire to rest after all. It had been a rough week. Clients came in like a selection from the madhouse. With the TV on in the background, Lisa sat down at her computer to finish writing an article. Meanwhile, Vanessa, having changed into her house clothes, was working on a billet. She loved to greet her husband with the table set and listen to him compliment her dishes. Andrew had gone to the landlord today to collect the rent, but for some reason he was late. The salad is ready. The pots on the stove were quiet, nodding, filling the kitchen with flavor, the assertive soup with the crunch of a huge bunch of greens. Vanessa looked at the kitchen clock. It was already 2.45 without looking. She reached for the bread and immediately yanked her hand away. Blood protruded on her finger near the handle, the bread sticking out, the pin pointing outward new silver. It fell on the table. Vanessa stared with horror, then at her, then at her finger. Blood dripped onto the freshly chopped hill. Waking up, she stuck her hand under the cold water and immediately shuddered. Andrew walked through the door with a slam. The draft made the glass in the window shrink. A pale Vanessa rushed to her husband. Andrew, Jesus, thank God you're here. What the hell is going on? She rushed to Andrew. He put his bag on the floor and looked at his wife confusedly. You've got no face on you. How did you manage to hurt your hand, tripping on the laminate? So now, I wash my hands and transfer you. The water was running in the bathroom in the kitchen. Vanessa was trying to understand where the pin came from in the bread of her thoughts, interrupted Andrew. He looked in the medicine cabinet for a bandage, but he couldn't see one. Where is it? It's a new bandage, unopened. It was lying around. I remember exactly. He even found iodine, even a band-aid. So he shook the iodine bottle in front of his wife. She sighed and began to help in the search. The bandage was found right away. Andrew muttered something under his nose, but tied his finger qualitatively and poked his wife in the forehead. Well, we'll win, now tell me. Andrew poured greens by handfuls, still wrinkling his nose, and like a cat, looking at his whiskers. Every now and then he wiped it with his finger. Glasses shouted with pleasure-loving broth, and Vanessa already distracted from bad thoughts and admired her husband. It was peaceful and cozy. About the pin pigeons, she did not tell anything. And tomorrow, they planned a trip to the store for groceries for a week. At night, Vanessa couldn't sleep for a long time. Anxious thoughts were climbing into her head, and her husband was quietly wheezing to himself, turned away to the window. At half past one in the morning, Vanessa couldn't stand it any longer and decided to drink tea. If she couldn't sleep, it would be better to spend some quality time, she thought, throwing on a terry blue robe. She quietly walked out of the bedroom and closed the door. Andrew was sleeping sweetly and unconcernedly, treading softly. Then she stepped on something. There was a crunch. It was hard. Vanessa turned on the wall sconces and bent down to look at a huge tall deer beetle lying on the floor. Vanessa picked it up and took a closer look in the light of the lamp. Wow, probably Andrew brought it from the Institute and it fell out of his bag. Friends of entomology gave it to him. What beauty was put on the shelf? Vanessa put the squashed beetle in the mirror in the hallway and went to the kitchen. While the kettle was boiling, she selected a sedative gathering pulled out her favorite cup and marmalade plate, thick flavored jam from last year's berry, and shortbread jubilee cookies. Ah, what a beauty, delicious. Licked the spoon, and Vanessa's thoughts were transported to the moment of berry picking. Huge human-sized thorny thickets. Oh, how painfully those thorns cut into her soft sides and scratched her arms. But Vanessa was not afraid of either insects or thorns. You've worked as an accountant for so many years, you'll never be afraid of anything. And then it takes three hours to make jam. But it would be worth it. 
Vanessa turned on the small TV on the kitchen wall, turned it down, and found some Turkish shuris. The tea conspired, and she slowly drank from the cup. It smelled unpalatable and pungent, but the jam was wonderful. A little time passed when there was a rumble in one of the rooms. Apparently flower pots had fallen on the floor. Vanessa flinched and jumped up. She felt a little dizzy and her eyes swam. But that's where her Polly should be rescued. Tukalov in her head. Opening the door to the flower room, Vanessa eyed. In the room was wide open window violets fell from the sill and shattered in the ceramic windowpane. And on her from the darkness looked monster with a huge foot, glowing like headlights eyes. It was a giant black spider. He stood in the middle of the room. And then the window sashes closed sharply against the draught. Behind three ran the panes of the old temples. The spider jumped up with a wild roar, threw himself on a rack of flowers. All began to fall in the darkness, thrashing at the monster, smashing the racks. Vanessa couldn't get a good look at what was happening, and it flooded in, clutched at her heart. Andrew. Andrew. God, save and preserve. She thrashed again until her back was against the hallway wall, and she slammed the door faster. The noise died down. It was dark. Her heart was tearing out of her chest, ta-ta-ta. It boomed in my ears, true. Coughing, I went to the light in the kitchen, but suddenly it was extinguished in the doorway appeared a tall, sinister figure. Something rich stood on two legs and shone with huge, glittering eyes. When had it raised its hand and pointed at her, Vanessa lost the remnants of her composure and ran down the hallway with a squeal. But it was suddenly endless. The faster she ran, the longer the corridor seemed to get, and the doors to the rooms began to open on their own. The ceiling began to drop. It was about to fall on her head. Gasping, she ran into the guest room and closed the door to the shopping. But even here, the walls began to surround her and close in on her. The wallpaper on the walls went god. Black like clean hands started coming out of them. Vanessa screamed, crossed herself, and fell to the couch without memory. That was where Andrew found her in the morning. The spring sun shone softly through the window singing the glory of spring. The birds, the shadows near joyfully a tit, entered Vanessa's window. Just like that, Andrew leaned over Vanessa, his whiskers pointed in different directions. He put on his homemade glasses and anxiously, looking at his spouse, Vanessa struggled to open her eyes. Everything was cloudy, but she perked up and sat up on the edge of the couch. Her head felt heavy. Her thoughts were jumbled. Oh, Andrew, I had a terrible dream, a nightmare. I couldn't sleep. I went to get a drink. I got a drink and I probably didn't notice how I fell asleep here. Andrew frowned, nervously rubbing the newspaper, but having collected his thoughts, calmly said to Vanessa, don't be nervous. During the night, a street cat got into one of your counselor's rooms and made a mess. From his words, Vanessa woke up and began to remember that huge spider studying on her violet. It's true what they say, fear is great. So it was a cat, she was imagining things. She thought. Andrew continued, seeing that his wife was not going to faint. It's all right. I'm already under the cops. And I'll have to go to the store for plastic pots and soil and plant everything back. And we'll use the leaves for shards. That's a great idea. Vanessa silently got up and went into that room to look. Her flower beds were an incredible mess. Violets were piled on the floor like a colorful Turkish carpet. A huge old palm tree was broken in half. She brought it from the dumpster. The palm tree had grown to the ceiling and was pleasing to the eye. It was painful to look at now. Vanessa quietly brewed coffee and sat silently at the table. Andrew fussed, tried to calm her down, but then just slammed the door. Vasha went alone. Vanessa called her friend Maria. She too was into plants, but her heart was set on the archbishops. Maria didn't come over right away, but as soon as she picked up the phone, Vanessa was somehow relieved. Hello. Hello, Vanessa. What's wrong? I just washed up after my walk. He's like a son, but you know that. Maria laughed into the phone. 
Jack was her elderly Iranian spit squirrel, a cloud on crooked legs. He didn't miss a single muddy puddle, and so every walk ended in a long, trivial routine. Yes, Maria. I've had a bit of an accident. Oh, bloody hell. In a word, can you come over? You take Jack with you, too. Andrew's coming. He's on a business trip. Not soon. I'm intrigued. I like mysticism. I'll come, I'll pack, and call a cab. I just listened. I got dressed. An hour later, the doorbell rang. Maria stood on the doorstep with a cake in one hand and a fluffy jack. She was, as always, on parade, short hair, gray hair, huge earrings made of rare African wood, and a long, beautiful dress in the style of Bosch. And all resting on her front paws was a chocolate leather jacket. Where do you want the cake to go? She laughed. Maria. Oh, what you are just a delight to the eye. Come, I've put tea on my hands and come into the kitchen. You can take the slippers off the cherry tree. They're special for you. Vanessa was very happy to see her friend. She felt calmer at heart. Jack was happily running on the laminate floor, cutting off his pantyhose and barking enthusiastically in the hallway. He loved to visit, and he was also skillful at begging for tidbits during meals. He did not suffer from a lack of appetite and had the shape of a ball. Maria went into the kitchen. Vanessa took out beautiful cups and poured fragrant Earl Grey. There was a cake on the table. I bought your favorite currant. There's a lot of prompter. The prompter is so thin and uncritical. Can you imagine how they baked it for you today? Thank you. I haven't had one in a long time. I hardly ever buy sweets. I haven't eaten my jam from the cottage since last year. I made raspberry and assorted raspberries. We only ate them all as strawberries, clinging to them. Andrew, I took half of it to my daughter's favorite. I don't know if she eats it or took it as a courtesy. Vanessa opened the cake lid to the fiddler and cut off two weighty tastes to herself and her friend they started tasting. Good cake, the freshest just Vanessa. Tell me what the hell is going on. Maria glanced around the kitchen. Vanessa swallowed a piece of cake and looked at her friend expressively. But it started. Yesterday I came back from the post office and found a dead pigeon under the apartment door. Not just any dead horse pigeon with nails and string. I'm sorry, it's not for the table. Of course, Vanessa can't spoil my appetite. I mean, what's with the string? The nails were big. Teenagers must have planted them. A lot of people have a bad head, but they look at all kinds of stuff on the internet and do crazy things. Vanessa twirled the cup in her hands and started picking at the cake with a spoon. I called Lisa. That's what she told me. And then when I was cooking in the kitchen, I punished my finger with a pin. It was sticking out of the bread, like someone had stuck it in there on purpose. Vanessa showed her ring finger. There was a puncture mark on it. That's a worrying sign. You have a lot of strangers in your house. Maria's more serious. Even Jack bored sadly under the table. He sincerely did not understand why he had not yet been given a cake. Maria twirled the cup, looking at the puppies so that they can spoil. Have you gotten any ill-wishers? Vanessa, you sell the best violets, business, and nothing personal. I sometimes have customers. They come home for orders. If I'm not home, Andrew gives them flowers. On Saturday, neither Andrew nor I were home before lunchtime. But on Friday, there was a real pilgrimage, six different women. They came one after another in the evening, and I had everything ready. Andrew gave everyone flowers on a list. I went to the theater with a classmate. She invited me to the play, and I got home at half past 12. And before lunch, the post office had no bread. So some chick gave me a slip. Probably your competitor slammed her palm on the table. She was sure of what she was saying. The arrangement with the competitor seemed to her quite logical. And to do what? How do you know if there is spoilage or not? I don't know anything about it. Vanessa looked at Masha as if she were a lifeline. Oh, I haven't told you about the dream yet. Last night, a cat climbed in the window and bombed my whole field. It's definitely a curse. And a black cat is not good. 
and these nightmares of yours. We should look for a psychic. The question is where to find a real one. Maria was thinking. A piece of cake fell from her spoon to the floor. Jack, who surrendered her legs, cut the biscuit in a flash, and his eyes bulged even more in anticipation of the continuation of the banquet. But the hostess was engrossed in other thoughts and did not notice him. Father Andrew told all. No, I didn't want to disturb him. He's a superstitious man. But I think I'll tell him anyway. It's been uncomfortable, Vanessa. In order not to aggravate the situation, Maria began to tell her friend how she flew to California to her son because her grandson was already a year old. She went for two weeks, showed from her phone, pictures of the ocean. High houses told how her son and daughter-in-law took her to an absolutely incredible water park. She almost met a very imposing male lifeguard there. I was like a champagne cork popping out of that tube up top. While I'm doing laps, so madly we serpentine. I was literally lost. And when I was finally in the pool, I couldn't figure out where the top was and where the bottom was. I can feel it. So strong hands picked me up and put me down. The pool was barely a meter deep. A smiling Mexican man, rather large and bald as a billiard ball, put me in. I saw my reflection as in a mirror. Maria laughed and surrounded me and barked happily too. Vanessa sounded the alarm. Then Will showed me the city, a completely different life. I'm glad he's working and his life is interesting, but I feel more at home. I miss it, of course, but at the same time, it's good to do what you want. You can live for yourself. I'll fly to my son for his birthday this summer for a whole month. He'll be happy. I'm for you. I'm really good. I found myself too. Yes, I have my favorite violets, but my cat killed part of my collection. Well, I'd already put some of them on my skull. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. How is Lisa getting married yet? Maria, what kind of marriage is she working on? She's got a career. She's a manager at a company. She's running around doing client work, selling software for universities, schools, various offices, and it pays well. But she doesn't have time for a personal life. Sometimes she goes out with her friends on weekends. Vanessa was drinking tea and looked at her watch. Oh, Andrew will be back soon. I have to make dinner and get started. I know I'm getting ready. We've started, we've chatted. It's time to do the honors. It's time to go home for lunch too. My poo pilot, my freak nickname, Maria lifted my pet in her arms and went to the corridor. We really had a good chat. I feel more at peace now. I'll talk to Andrew. We'll think about what to do. Vanessa stood up to see her friend off. That's right. You should talk to your husband about this. He's the protector. But call me when you find a psychic. I wonder what Maria will say, hugged Vanessa and left for the elevator. Vanessa put the cake in the refrigerator and decided that if she was going to rest, she would not cook, but would make dumplings and salad. Andrew really likes dumplings, doesn't he? Andrew returned with bags of groceries and a pile of pots. He was very tired after a shower, with great enthusiasm began to take away hot dumplings, abundantly approving them with fatty sour cream and green onions. He told her how his day had gone, asked for more, and he and Vanessa proceeded to drink tea and candy in the living room behind the big TV. There Vanessa realized that her spouse was fed up and calm, and it was okay to tell him everything. She left out part of the story so as not to spoil her impression of herself, but otherwise she dumped everything on him as it was. He listened, frowned, didn't interrupt. Then he took off his glasses, and having checked them, put them on his red and ruined nose. That's how it is. He stretched out. At work, a colleague told me a month ago about that his wife made a spell, and he went to a lady second, or something, and she helped him. She took it all the way, and he divorced his wife. And it came out that both his sons weren't his, but a friend of his from high school. He gave me his card. I'll look it up. Might make you feel better. You're so smart, Andrew. You're a gold mine. I'll call that fortune teller tomorrow. Maybe it really is a spell. Monday morning, the alarm clock rattled under my pillow. 
Lysa was adamant. Disagree with him, but which one? It's seven o'clock. She'd only gone to sleep at two. Fumbled for it. She looked with one eye at the smartphone screen. But why? Why? 700. I didn't even have time to sleep. I hate mornings. Lisa fell face first into the cool pillow. She wanted to fall into Pillowland, where there were always cool pillows, a cozy blanket, and no worries. But the drive to the center was not a short one. It took an hour and a half to drive. Lisa pulled herself off the pillow with an effort of will. The room was unpleasantly cold. The open window could beat the heat of the radiator, and the room had cooled a few degrees overnight. A hand in the heavy, shaggy cold. She tiptoed to her slippers. Walking across cold laminate flooring and warm shawls was absolutely not what they wanted. They wanted to carry away the mistress, the warm plush plates. In the bathroom, Lisa held her hands under the hot water for a long time. Cold fingers would not warm her in any way. She sat on the edge of the tub and frantically did the washing up a few times and ran to the kettle. Lisa had a studio apartment, so the only room at once was both kitchen, living room, and bedroom found herself with half a liter of sweet tea and warming up in the microwave. A cheese sandwich. She turned on her laptop at the table to look up the latest news, quotes and find some interesting video on YouTube. At the same time, she sent the editor a story. So she wouldn't be so sad about going to work. She turned up the volume and turned on some funny cat videos. She only realized it when the phone rang. The male voice on the other end was offering loans from another bank with a very favorable interest rate. Lissa didn't listen to the offer until she saw that it was 8 o'clock and in half an hour she should be on the bus to New York. Why am I sitting there? I'm late. The important thing is not to be late for work. Lisa sat down, trying not to forget her charger, laptop, and makeup on the way, quickly throwing on her coat and jumped into her favorite battalions. She sank down, slinging a weighty backpack over her shoulder. What followed was an exciting ride. She caught the bus at the last second. As it should be, it was packed to the brim with scowlers and castle dwellers. Me on this sunny April morning. Everything was still crumpled. The man with the vigor gripped the air in tightly and loomed over the man sitting in the headphones. The student, he mused, was asleep. The toxic mixture of booze and cologne was no match for him. The almost undressed girls were chattering at a deliberately loud volume. It was spring. And now it's summer, Roma. Shouldn't we liven up the bus atmosphere? Was he coughing hoarsely all the time? A woman at the window couldn't stand it and started cursing. She was being shoved in unison by grannies with huge carts full of underpants for sale. Lisa stood flush against the driver's cab and clutched her backpack to her chest. The headphones lay there as well. Trying to drown out the unpleasant sounds, she closed her eyes and imagined that she was now on the sea. The noise of the road was the churning and rumbling of the waves, and the women's voices turned into cackling more often than not the cries of seagulls. Of course I'm awake. Someone shouted in her ear. The crowd poured out of the bus into the stream of people rushing them to the subway entrance. Lisa jumped in and merged with the crowd. On the subway, she pulled out her headphones and fell into her playlist. She got to the office on time, she said hello to the second manager, the accountant, and plopped into the cold chair in front of the monitor, exhaled, and pulled out her laptop. It was cold, and she set it aside warmed up on the edge of the desk, closing her eyes. She put her thoughts in order. Sleeping in the workplace, the loud voice of the principal made Lisa literally jump. Max, I'm just loading my CPU to work efficiently in the office. Did you give me a scare? Way to go, processor. That's good. Here's the thing. I need to call the client. There's some kind of software malfunction. Take Frank and double check it. The money's going to another company. You got me. Max gave Lissa an expressive look. She looked between his eyebrows. Max had a slight squint, and she could never decide which eye to look at. Yeah, I get it. I'll go figure it out. Well, great. I look forward to hearing from you. I'll be myself. 
Max called out, nodding his office keys, walking towards the coffee machine. Lissa looked sadly at the cosmetics and went to find Frank. He was working on the second floor. She went up to his abode. Frank was a classmate of hers. He was the one who had helped her get a job here. Their agreement was that she was to buy him coffee periodically, specifically caramel. Lisa walked over and placed a hot cup in front of him. Frank turned around and took off his headphones, looked up at Lisa and smiled. Oh, hi. Thank you for the coffee. What's your question for me? Max asked me to double check the job. It's the ones that sell jewelry or express. There's always something wrong with their website. And the recalculation program is glitchy too. This is the third time they've sent me a complaint. And today they complained to the director. Please check it again. Lisa sat in the chair next to me. Yeah, let's see what they've got. As the weekend passed, Frank drummed his fingers on the keyboard like an expert pianist. Windows popped up one after another. He opened up the morning of the site. Sunday, we had a photo shoot with some friends. Then they went to the movies, but on Saturday just slowed down, thinking whether to tell or not, but decided to tell. And on Saturday, Frank was waiting for a sequel. My mother called me and said that a dead pigeon was thrown under her door with threads and nails, and she was really freaked out, wasn't she? Wow, I can imagine. Good thing it wasn't a pig's head. That would have been worse. It's a very popular intimidation technique in the Mafia. It goes way back. Thank you. What's missing is the pig's head. Do you think it's a joke or was it really meant to scare? My mother grows violets. She's not a politician or a criminal. So I found it. We'll fix it and it'll work. Let the client know what's coming up at lunch. All set. Liz will check it out. Don't worry about it. Forget the pigeon. Lisa went to work. It was still a busy five days until the weekend. Monday morning was Vanessa's morning. She got up early and prepared to protect herself from spoilage. She had read on the internet that she should wash the floor everywhere with salt. A task for such a huge apartment is not for the weak. So Vanessa decided to take a less radical approach by simply sprinkling rock salt in the corners. Deciding that half the job was done, she walked Andrew to work and got up the courage to call the number on the business card. The black cardboard had a balloon, candles, and it said that Emily, a practicing magician, would remove any spoilage, evil eye, or hex, bringing her husband back into the family and sparing her children a burrow for it with a sigh. Vanessa made up her mind, dialing a number. She waited for the voice of some grandmother, but she was answered by a young girl, listened kindly, got into the essence of the problem, and made an appointment at her magical office. Vanessa exhaled for that evening, wrote down the address and assured that she would be at the specified location by six. She spent the day in some suspense. The wait dragged on, asked his long Turkish cereals and transplanting violets. The work argued. It was light again in the flower beds. Dented violets perked up and stood in even rows, and their broken leaves protruded from the many cups waiting for babies. Finished Vanessa, made a photo of all the cups of seedlings, and posted on the site in the sales section. Palm she is, and abundantly innocent, and tugged tightly with duct tape. She still hoped the palm tree would come together. Finished with the plants, she had a snack and some spaghetti sauce she purchased at the grocery store the other day. It tasted fatty and sour, but it had a hint of basil. I couldn't get a bite down my throat. So Vanessa made herself a sandwich with raspberry jam. There was no bread left. Half a handy bun. Fresh butter from oak and raspberries went very well together. The world sparkled with new colors. Looking at her watch, Vanessa realized it was time to get ready. I don't know how much the consultation will cost. She took $800 from her stash. She carefully tucked it away in her red leather wallet and put it deep in her purse. She took a cab. The car took her quickly to her destination. The magician's office was on the basement floor of an old building on Park Culture. The basement floors there were arranged for workshops, children's circles. Vanessa walked through the wrought iron gates into the archway and found the right door. She took out a leaflet with the code from the intercom 
and carefully pressed the worn gray buttons of the door click. Vanessa saw a dark staircase. Leading downward pulled the lobby of the house as if from a crypt. Vanessa braced herself harder, tangled her volunteer, and clutched her purse to her chest. The steps were old, covered with green paint. The walls and ceiling of the basement were painted the same way. Vanessa went down and saw a black door on the left with a peephole on the side. On the wall was an old doorbell, dusty and gray. On one wiring, it did not inspire confidence, and she did not want to touch it at all. I had to knock. Timidly at first, then more confidently. Vanessa knocked on the door. There was silence on the other side. Then, somewhere far away, footsteps were heard at the door, behind Falcon's key. The door was opened by a young woman, a huge, thick mop of copper, almost red hair and very dark makeup. Her yellow eyes seemed huge in her face, she numerous heavy bracelets on her arms, and on her chest hung a round pendant of silver Amazonia. Hello, you Vanessa, come in. The sorceress gestured toward the back of the room. It was bright, but it was gloomy. A light bulb burned dimly above the entrance. The air was dusty, stuffy, the kind you always get in basements where there is no air. To the left and right lay old dusty furniture, some paintings in a row of smarties and a crackling, knowing wooden easel. Vanessa looked curiously at the furnishings and from the back, she heard a voice as if giving answers to her thoughts. There used to be an artist's studio here. He died a couple of years ago, and I rented it out. You go on ahead. There's a chair. Sit down, tell me. And indeed, there was a rather large room. There were chairs along the walls, and there was a large window under the ceiling, part of which was covered by the road. You could see the feet of people passing by, the cold air from the street. Vanessa sat down at a chair open, burgundy, velvet, tablecloth. In the middle of the table stood on supplies and candle holder their multicolored candles and a crystal ball on a bronze stand. Emily, a magician in some generation, sat down across from her and pulled tarot cards from a wooden box. Talk to me. I will make a diagnosis and we will discuss further stages of work. Emily Insight looked at Vanessa. She, like her tongue, swallowed, empty in the head, doesn't know what to ask. I gathered my thoughts and briefly told her story. And then she asked me a question. Do you think it's a spell? I'm very worried. Let's find out. Let's see. Emily took out the cards of the beast again and began to turn them over carefully. One card, one card, two cards, three cards. Looked at Vanessa, shook her head, opened the fourth and finally the fifth. Turning the last one over, she showed it to Vanessa and poked it with her index finger with a bright red manicure. This is the devil's card. You're definitely spoiled. Oh, Vanessa blurted out, and she expressed her purse on the floor. What am I going to do? She hastily bent down to pick up the bag. First of all, it is necessary to do a purification and then to put protection on you. It will take at least three complex rituals. The spoilage is serious. If you don't do the right rituals, You'll go to the other world in a couple of months. Emily was putting the cards back in the box. So I'm a serious person. What do we need to do? Can we start this cleanse now? Before it's too late. Vanessa looked at Emily hopefully. We can do the first stage today and the next one in about a week. You will need to prepare and we will do the ritual at midnight on the waning moon. Just before the new moon now, the first stage will cost $400. But if there's resistance, it could be more expensive, then there's money. I brought 20,000 with me, doing the ritual. That's great. Now put your purse on the table for now. You need to sit up straight. Put your hands in front of you on the table. Now I'm going to fix your eyes and begin to curate the herbs for you. I will place three candles in front of you, yellow, red, and green. The ritual will go on until all three candles are burning. Then I will throw them into the water. Now I see your eyes relax and think good thoughts. Vanessa tuned into the process. A clear dark blindfold was placed over her eyes. She heard footsteps and lit a match a metal plate of herbs was placed in front of her. 
A sweet, pleasant aroma of burning herbs floated through the room, and the paper had a quiet warmth. Emily mumbled and muttered some sausage of words. Vanessa didn't notice that she had fallen asleep. She woke up to being touched lightly on the shoulder by Vanessa. Everything had gone well. The first purge took a lot of effort, but we got through it. Now you need to rest, and I'm waiting for you. On Friday, we will do the ritual early to consolidate the result. That'll be $500. I think I fell asleep. I feel so light, so happy, away off my shoulders. Thank you. Vanessa felt so uplifted. She wanted to love the whole world. She felt like she was 20 again, and it was spring. She handed the money to Emily and jumped outside. It was already 9 o'clock p.m., and Vanessa decided to walk to the subway. She admired the light of the yellow street lamps, looked at the old houses with stucco. She sighed cheerfully and air of evening New York, and reached home unnoticed. Andrew was waiting at home. He met his spouse in the hallway and looked at her expectantly. And Vanessa sat on a chair and smiled. Andrew, it's great. I got help. My soul is singing Andrew. Andrew hugged Vanessa and sighed. Let's go eat. I fried cutlets, made mashed potatoes. Brandy girls playfully nodded. He stood in front of Vanessa. Come on, Andrew. She waved, taking off her boots. At night, Vanessa slept as soundly as she hadn't slept in a long time. The day had ended well. And at Lisa's, in addition to her paycheck, she got quarterly bonuses. They walked to the subway with Frank. He told her stories of his life. He'd had a hobby for a long time. He collected bone computers and often went to clients' homes, took a system unit, and refined it in the workshop. What he didn't find inside the old computers. The classic variant is eternal dust on the wheel and mother's dress. Problem solved with a vacuum cleaner. He once found a real hamster money inside. He later learned from the owner that their pet had been missing for three years. There was another interesting find. Inside there was a warehouse cap from pens, rubber, all sorts of little things, which was driven under the system unit by the owner's cat. Frank kept hoping that he would find someone's forgotten stash, but the only valuable finds were a few ruble coins. One day, he was fixing the upstairs neighbor's computer. The work dragged on. It was summer, and one day they started replacing the central heating pipes in their building. All the apartments from the 12th to the first floor had their old pipes and radiators cut off. The neighbors' lives changed overnight. A big hole from the pipe connected all the apartments, but friendly neighbors of the 6th and 5th floor did not miss the opportunity to take the problem to the plus side. Now they have a point. The transmission is even better than sports. Through a hole in the ceiling Frank received from a buddy, then a flash drive with movies, then a can of beer or they could just chat about life. The audibility was perfect, but the fun had to end sooner or later. New pipes were brought in and the hole in the ceiling closed again. The installer started welding from the attic. In the room of every resident of the 12-story building, there was a gray, welded new pipe. Frank didn't care what kind of pipe was in the room, but not Martin, the upstairs neighbor. No, his perfectionist nature couldn't stand it that squalor in his bedroom. Martin bought expensive paint, picked strictly in color. Everything had to harmonize with the interior. When he went out for a smoke, he told me how good he was for painting the pipe himself. How long did he and the master take to find the right shade? It's a gorgeous orange caramel color. It's a little steamy, but beautiful. Frank, of course, was pleased. He said it was a very beautiful pipe. But aren't you being a little hasty, Martin? Maybe there's more work to be done. To which Martin dismissed it. But the next day, the workers realized what they were missing. It was inconvenient to weld pipes in the basement, so they decided to just yank the pipe up a little and down. At half past 10 in the morning, they pulled. The Martin pipe disappeared overnight and appeared at Frank's beautifully. With a light vapor, it glistened against his gray loft style wall. From above, Martin shouted. Meeting from the balcony in just his underpants, he called out to Frank, give me back my pipe. Or rather, Frank squeezed the bends into three dead bodies. 
Martin sat on the tiles from the balcony. It was unclear whether he was crying or laughing. But he couldn't smoke. I told you not to hurry. It's my pipe now. Of course, Martin ordered new paint, but painted the pipe only when the workers assured him that all the work was finished. At home, Lisa remembered Frank. He was so cheerful. He was nice and easy to be with. Perhaps she didn't go to work just for the paycheck. The long-awaited Friday came. All week, Vanessa had been preparing for her second ritual with a list of essentials and instructions. Emily had sent it to her in the mail. Everything was strictly point by point. The first was to throw a coin over her shoulder every day while walking. At the same time, imagining that the coin leads all the bad thoughts forever. The second was to do foot baths and wash your face with salt water every evening. The third is to bring a piece of raw meat or liver by Friday. The third item made Vanessa uncomfortable. If throwing a coin, washing with salt water, raw meat went nowhere, but she was determined to buy a piece of liver from the store in the morning. Vanessa waited for the evening. Andrew was frowning for some reason, and every time he opened the refrigerator, Vanessa sighed heavily. Maybe it's not worth the ritual. Fry it with onions. But Vanessa was adamant. Andrew sighed and decided to go to the doctor to prepare the house for the May holidays. Vanessa let him go because business is business. And today she had magic to do. Tomorrow is the post office and there will be other things to do around the house. Andrew packed a bag, wished her good luck and kissed her as he left for a business trip for the last time. The smell of his perfume with a hint of whiskey remained in the hallway, and Vanessa decided to watch some life-affirming movie on TV. She put the chicken in the oven and sat on the kitchen sofa with the remote control in her hands. For about 40 minutes, she bounced from channel to channel, until the kitchen became filled with the taste of inferior, flavor forbidden with vegetables and chicken. The air wanted to be eaten with a spoon. That was the signal that the dish was ready. The bird was seared. Taking out the chicken, she separated herself a ruddy screen, poured pomegranates of your juice, and had a delicious dinner. Before leaving, she put the liver in three bags, called a cab for a half-hour drive outside frost. Spring rain, a coarse rain that washed away the remnants of snow piles. There was standing water under the trees. The ground slowly soaked up moisture and chewed the trees, cursed the first leaves of the birch. On the lilac bushes, burst buds were climbing feather flower. On the flowered, brightly burned orange, purple headers of the exhibition. Vanessa marveled, such brightness in the middle of a gray city. Well, here she goes down to the basement again. So much for Emily coming out. Today she had that high ponytail and was wearing a silk dress and robe. She politely invited Vanessa in. There were candle holders with black candles on the table. The window was behind a looming black hole and smelled of scandal. The dusty air stood in murky columns. Vanessa sat down at the table. Did you bring raw meat? Emily asked. Everything was done as I wrote. Yes, of course, everything on the list. I bought fresh raw liver at the store. Vanessa held out the bag. Great. Emily took out a copper basin from under the table and put it on the velvet tablecloth. The liver and brandy fell out of the bag and into the basin, smelling of metal and blood. Vanessa watched as Emily went into the next room and brought out two bottles of red wine and a snake glass. Vanessa, I'm going to pour you the wine now. In the glass, I added some magical herbs. While I pour the wine into this liver, you should have time to drink. In the meantime, I will recite the incantation. All the evil from you will pass from you into this flesh. Concentrate. Emily poured Vanessa a glass. Dark stumps began to rise from the bottom. They swirled like a tea brew. Something inside resisted Vanessa didn't want to drink this wine at all. But she didn't want to back down either, so she bravely took the glass and prepared herself. The witch raised the bottle of wine on her pelvis and began to mutter a magical incantation. Vanessa tasted the drink. The wine tasted like crap. Sour taste, like a mountain with a bitter aftertaste of wormwood. 
Before Vanessa's eyes red wine with a pungent odor of alcoholic surrogate poured from the bottle on the liver. Meanwhile, Emily was reciting spells louder and louder. Finally, exploding into a scream, she threw the bottle on the floor. Vanessa finished drinking and wanted to put the glass on the table. As Emily snatched a copper dagger from under the tablecloth and swung it at Vanessa, she shrieked as the blade swung across Vanessa's face, blood and wine splattered from her liver. And Emily screamed, so be it, and folded her arms in front of her. Everything was going according to plan. The ritual was over. That was all. Vanessa asked shyly, yes, we're done with your $600 for today. Since the work is very serious, we need to keep the balance of power. I buried this liver at the crossroads tonight. Are you watching the dark forces? They might start scaring you into not coming here anymore. But you watch for the signs, take notes. And I look forward to seeing you on April 13th for the final ritual. Assuming, of course, all goes well. Emily conjured up the candles and turned on the chandelier. Vanessa sat confusedly in her chair. The sum dumbfounded her as it was double the previous one. But having nothing to do, she held out the money. This time, there was no mental uplift. Inside was empty. Exactly the same as in the wallet. There was no joy in my stomach either. I had to call a cab. At home, Vanessa had a digestive upset. She spent the night anxiously running to the restroom. But by morning, she felt incredibly light inside. And she even seemed to have lost a few pounds. Feeling uplifted and proud, she decided to call Lisa. She wanted to tell her how well she had thought of going to the magician and that there was one more cleaning left, then protection, and she would be safe from spoilage. She was the only one who never found out who had done it. But she decided it didn't matter. It was all about protection. After waiting until 11 o'clock, she dialed Lisa. She didn't pick up right away. Hello, hello. How are you? What's new? I was in the shower, so I didn't hear the call right away. At that moment, Lisa was sitting on the edge of the bed, tangled in a fluffy towel. Lisa, hi. It's good to hear from you, sweetie. How are you doing at work? Everything's smooth. Vanessa was mentally hugging her daughter. I missed her so much. Well, the week went by really fast. The orders were few, but all in good amounts. Frank, and I exceeded the plan seems good. That's it. I'm free tonight. Let's go to the cafeteria, have a chat. Oh, I don't know about the cafeteria. My stomach's been churning all night. Why don't we go for a walk on Arbat at my place? It's a sunny day. I've got some news. I'll tell you. Vanessa made a conspiratorial tone. All right, I'll be at your place in two hours on the highway. You're my schemer. By the way, Andrew, what's not at home? He's at the dacha getting ready for May Day. It's a little early, but better early than late. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye, Vanessa hung up the phone and looked out the window. It was getting warmer. Green or clouds of delicate foliage on the bushes were quickly flying joyful insects. Birds were bursting, competing with each other and singing. And against the piercing blue sky, the breeze played the humble birch trees. Vanessa spotted a small ladybug on the horse frame. The orange bug crawled upward, looking for a way out. Vanessa opened the window and gently nudged the insect into the fresh air. The bug wasted no time and flew upward, turning into a dot. How nice, Vanessa thought. I should dress up. I want to be just as bright. Vanessa pulled out a dress and large pearls from Vassal Cove's closet. She jumped out of the house like a butterfly. Music was playing. Signs flashed on all sides. The people of the metropolis were walking. Vanessa was engrossed, looking at the painted matryoshka dolls. They were brightly colored, perfect souvenirs for foreign tourists. That's where Lisa met her. She came over and quietly touched her shoulder. Hi, Mom. What's so interesting? Oh, you're here already. I was looking at the souvenirs. It's all very, very colorful. Vanessa put the nesting doll back. The salesman was glumly reading a newspaper. Radio Shanson was playing nearby. Well, shall we go? 
Why don't you tell me what the news is? Yeah, I think I'll have a coffee too. It smells like baked goods in here. The whole street's trying to tempt me with something delicious. They walk towards the credit card and coffee stand. The sign had all sorts of pretty pictures on it. There's a pink pretzel with strawberries, fried, bacon, tea coffee for every taste. Lisa chose a large cappuccino and a poppy seed bun. And Vanessa decided to try lats with raspberry syrup. Raspberries were her favorite, and the berry smells like lax to you. A very small Lisa. There was a faint steam coming from the glass. Vanessa tasted the hot drink, the flavor of coffee and bright sweet raspberries. Very hot and intensely sweet. But I like it. Vanessa smiled. Lisa, how do you feel about magic? Suddenly, she asked her daughter. I don't even know. Are you stumping me? Never thought Lisa raised one eyebrow questioningly. I went to the witch. She said I had a curse on me. I've been clean twice now, and I'm over it. Vanessa helped me so much Lisa's eyes widened as she shyly looked away. She couldn't decide how to react. After all, she's a sensible person. What spell? What sorceress? Mom, my God, you're not kidding. Did you really go to some fortune teller, not a gypsy? Of course not a gypsy. I was put in touch with Andrew, a hereditary magician. She's serious. Vanessa frowned. Lisa couldn't believe her ears. Her mom's an accountant, a man who only trusted numbers. And suddenly she went to some magician. Mom, how much did you pay her? What spoilage? It's all a hoax. Lisa, I'm an adult. I understand what you're going through. But trust me, it's true. It was a woman who did the reading. The cards were so ugly. And she did rituals, spells. They helped. Vanessa started to get nervous. She was waiting. Though what could she expect? Young people have become so pragmatic. They only believe in money and their gadgets. I thought you'd be supportive and happy. Money is not important. I won't argue, but please be careful. I don't trust these magicians. Lisa wanted a cappuccino and a walk. Lisa, I need money for the last ritual. I don't have enough. I'll pay you back for sure. Vanessa looked piercingly at Lisa. Mom, how much $100 do I have on me? No more. That's right. One last ritual. Lisa reached into her purse. But Mom stopped her, stunned by one phrase I need. I've decided to stash everything and no more. I have to finish the job or something bad will happen. Mom, I can't give you that kind of money. And you're taking it to that Charlotte Anka. Yes, I'd better add it and go on vacation or buy new clothes. Mom, are you scaring me? Lysa threw the uneaten coffee into the trash can. Her mom was standing in front of her talking such nonsense. I got it all right. I'll probably go home. I'm not feeling well again. I'll call you and you go for a walk. The weather is nice today. Vanessa could barely contain her resentment. Inside everything was trembling. She went home and Lisa sat down on a bench and watched her trail off in the shower. Lisa was having a very hard time now. She had had a fight with her mom, but it couldn't be left like this. So she decided to find out what kind of witch was spinning her mother for money. Vanessa returned home feeling upset. There was a seed of doubt inside. Maybe her daughter was right, but fear didn't give common sense a chance. Vanessa changed into her homemade clothes and decided to brew some soothing tea, assuring a cup and taking individual waffles. She decided to spend time in the living room behind the big TV. Jumping from one gear to the next, she noticed something moving in the room. At first she noticed an insect on the wall, but she didn't pay attention to it. There was such a heartwarming episode of Let Them Talk on TV that Vanessa began to drink tea more actively. The waffles quickly disappeared from the confetti, but then she noticed a huge cockroach crawling across the table. Oh, what a nuisance. Vanessa swatted the cockroach with a magazine and lay on the edge of the table. But then another one came out, and Vanessa saw it. With horror, she realized that there were many huge cockroaches crawling along the walls too. Their shiny backs were like lacquered paint, 
Vanessa jumped up from the couch. The cockroaches came out of nowhere. It became frightening. What was it? What is it? From where? Vanessa read. There was a woman screaming on the TV. Vanessa felt uneasy and ran into the kitchen to get some insect repellent. Everything was under the sink, but the right product was nowhere to be found. Vanessa dreamed, hooked, but finally she found the right can. She prepared for battle, but when she returned to the living room, to her amazement, she found not a single cockroach. What on earth was going on? Just what was the parade here? Vanessa walked over to the couch and began to remove the cushions from it, but nothing there either. Suddenly something in the hallway started nodding so evenly, as if someone was walking in heels. Vanessa turned around. Past the doorway came a goat, a very real grey-horned goat. She slowly walked past the guest. Vanessa panted and started to cross herself. God save the devil. What's going on? Vanessa walked along the wall and looked out into the hallway. The lights were off, but the walls were moving for some reason. She stepped out and saw that the light was coming from strange drawings on the wall. Where had they come from? There were phosphorus inscriptions on the painted walls. And suddenly, they were roundels, forming strange words, the meaning of which Vanessa did not understand. But she screamed and ran to the room with the flowers. But there were burning writings and drawings here too. She was so frightened that, gasping for breath, she began to dash around the apartment looking for the telephone, but couldn't find it in the semi-darkness of the room, until suddenly it rang. Vanessa saw it on the sofa in the kitchen. It was Andrew. Vanessa pressed the button with shaky hands, but instead of a native voice, a long bleeding sound came from the receiver. Vanessa shrieked and dropped the phone. Reciting the Our Father, she emerged into the darkness until she accidentally hit the light switch. Immediately, the kitchen became bright. Vanessa picked up the phone. It was ringing. It was as if a veil had been lifted from her eyes. Why didn't she just turn on the lights and run around in the dark and panic, going everywhere and turning on the lamps? Chandeliers she created a complete illumination in the apartment. The lettering was gone. Everything stood still. The TV was playing music and a commercial for the cleaner was on. There was no goat either. Vanessa convinced herself that it was a dream. She fell asleep in front of the TV a little calmer. She poured the rest of the tea in the sink, washed a cup and made coffee. Something was making her a little dizzy. Vanessa took out yesterday's cutlets from the refrigerator, sliced white bread, and took hot coffee. Decided to continue watching TV. The cold cutlets were delicious. Vanessa let go again. All thoughts came to normal and she decided to write to Emily. She needed to narrate the creepy things that had happened to her. In her letter, she mentioned cockroaches, a goat, and the reply was not long in coming. Emily wrote that such visions say that it is urgent to make a defense and should come to her on Monday. In the meantime, it was necessary to revive herbs, which she would send tomorrow by courier, of course, for a fee. Vanessa decided to keep the defense against the forces of evil and light. She did not put out and lay down very far past midnight. She kept dreaming of rustling and scraping. It seemed as if someone was sighing, scraping, and knocking nearby. First thing in the morning, she called her husband. He didn't come to the phone for a long time. And then, out of breath, Asiad explained in a voice that he sawed an apple tree in the garden. Over the winter it cracked and began to rot Antonovka, and this year will not be. Sad, he said. Andrew, when are you coming? It's scary at home without you. There's something damnable going on again. I'm afraid to turn off the lights. Vanessa's got a lot of work to do. I'll be there Monday morning. What was that dream you had again? A bad one. Andrew was panting impatiently on the other end of the line. I don't know. I don't think so. I'm scared. I'm not going to see Emily until Wednesday. Vanessa, step into the room. She felt completely defenseless. Andrew was not going to run to her rescue. Vanessa, take a sedative. Watch movies at home. Everybody has bad dreams. You're exaggerating the problems. I know you're bored when you retire.
but I can't just drop everything and come down here right now. Pull yourself together. Vanessa couldn't recognize her husband. He was terribly cold, and she sensed a note of irritation in his voice. She couldn't find anything to say and hung up. She was alone now. She didn't want to call her daughter. Why worry her with her fears? After lunch, the courier brought her a large bag of groin. It was heavily warm wooded and was washed. Vanessa paid for the delivery and began to follow. The instructions were to put these plants everywhere in faces and set them on fire to weave. Vanessa obediently set to work. And so the apartment was filled with terry bitter smoke. It was stifling to the eyes. But Vanessa courageously endured and did not open the windows. So she sat for several hours and did not notice how she fell into oblivion. Something cold and wet brought her to consciousness. She did not realize where she was, what was happening. Her eyes were a hop of silence and her head and chest hurt badly, as if from underwater. She heard her husband's voice. He seemed to be arguing with someone on the phone. But then he noticed Vanessa coming to her senses. She was moving her hands as if removing cobwebs from her face. Stuffy, stuffy, what's going on? She barely saw anything. Vanessa, Vanessa, can you hear me? Look, look, there was a doctor. You need to sign a waiver for hospitalization. That's when Vanessa felt a pen being put in her hand. She gathered her will and signed all the sheets. Her strength left her and she collapsed. Ligaments dusk, the morning came. Vanessa stirred. A heart fever clung to her cheeks. Bowu. She sat in the bedroom on her bed. It was cool and crisp. The window was open. Outside, the road rumbled deafeningly Rapallo the asphalt, the windshield wiper's broom. Vanessa felt a little strange, but her head was clear. She got up quietly, tangled herself in her robe, and went into the kitchen. The apartment was quiet, but from the kitchen came the vanilla scent of baking. Andrew was frying pancakes, a mound, ruddy piglets rested on the table. The pancakes were puffy and there was a lacy steam coming off of them. A glass teapot stood nearby steaming. It was reddening, a good brew of coarse leaf tea. Vanessa saw her favorite jam in a crystal rosette. Andrew called softly to her spouse. He turned around, holding the shovels in his hands. His gaze was anxious, but he smiled cautiously. Wake up at last, red maiden, and I made pancakes. Taste them. Vanessa began to sow love-filled. I her and carried her to the table. Andrew gave her a white saucer and a jam spoon, poured hot tea, and she didn't live in a warm robe. Andrew, how nice of you to come. I thought I'd fallen out of love. She was slyly eyeing my pancakes, and her husband, with a slight change in his face, refused the top. It's a good thing I'm here. You almost burned down the apartment with your brooms. I come in and from the threshold smoke in my face all bought wormwood and you're unconscious on the couch. I open all the windows. There's a draft. I wiped you with a cold towel. I wanted to call an ambulance. But is it that small? Thank God you scared me. Andrew had a grip on his breakfast. He wouldn't touch it. Andrew, I won't do it again. I'll protect the brooms, and no more brooms will be needed. But Andrew was frowning. Some thought was bothering him. He looked at Vanessa differently, but she could see he was worried about her. She wouldn't tell her bad dreams. She wanted to enjoy this morning. Meanwhile, Lisa was having a hard time at work. Since the morning everything was falling out of her hands, machinery was breaking down and she couldn't stand it. She went to Frank. Taking her ship slats, she went up to the second floor. Frank was sitting in his seat staring at a monitor. A glass of coffee slumped on the chair next to him. He looked up and smiled, but the smile quickly disappeared from his face. A pale Lisa stood in front of him. What's wrong? He stood up and sat her down next to him. I need help. My mom is in contact with some charlatan fortune teller and is giving her large sums of money to remove spoilage. I'm afraid something terrible might happen. Frank, you're smart. Help me. This scammer needs to be brought out. What do we do? Wow, 
But your mom's not boring though. But look, we need to get this woman's number and address, and then report her to the police. Yeah, I'll ask my mom. But why is she so gullible? Why is this mystery in her life? That's what she remembered. Andrew gave me the witch's number. I remembered. Andrew gave her Andrew's card. He gave her the idea. Oh, that's not good. Lisa grabbed her head. It's okay. Now call your mom and get that witch's number and address. I'll go with you. We'll go see her and talk. Frank tried to support Lisa, seeing how excited she was. But Vanessa didn't pick up the phone. It was getting wordy. Lisa texted her mom and waited for a reply. But Vanessa answered closer to lunchtime. As soon as the text message arrived, Lisa rushed to Frank again. They looked together on the map for directions to this magical place. Emily didn't answer the phone, which was suspicious. So they decided to go for luck. Lisa took the whole next day off. Frank said he would work from home since he had a stomach ache. So they lined up a free day and drove to the appointed address. Old town yellow stuccoed houses, narrow streets, and a bright blue sky over New York. A warm, wonderful day, a loop. And among the houses, they found the right entrance in an archway. The wrought iron doors creaking, sponges furred, tearing away in the archway's vault. You can't get through here silently, Frank said. They found the entrance to the cellar by dialing the cat on the door. They went down the green stairs to the very door. A torn out door lock hung sadly. Frank knocked rumblingly on the door. Lisa listened tensely, trying to catch any sound on the other side. Frank knocked again. Soft footsteps were heard, and the door clicked shut. A short elderly man appeared on the threshold. His fluffy white hair was a little axe counted, and his head glowed from the bright lamp above the entrance. Hello, young people. He looked at the uninvited guests with a little surprise, then glanced at his watch. Classes start in two hours. You're a little early, aren't you? Hello, we're here to see Emily. She's a mage, a healer. We were given this address. Lisa was showing on her smartphone screen a picture of a business card. Gentlemen, you must have the wrong address. This is my art studio. I teach painting. I don't look like a sorcerer. Grandpa laughed. He had kind eyes, rosy cheeks, a white beard. He was more like Santa Claus. How come? We were given the correct address and a description of how to go. Excuse me, have you ever rented out your workshop to anyone? Frank was trying to get to the bottom of it. Was there something fishy going on? No, of course not. Although I was at a health spa for about a month, I looked in my son's workshop, but he didn't tell me anything. The grandfather must have realized that in his absence, his son could have made a gamble to make money. You know what? Leave your number. I'll talk to my son find out what's going on, and I'll call you. Ah, uh, thank you. Sure, I'd really appreciate it. Lissa dictated her number, and the painter promised to call her back. They left the dungeon, and sat down on a bench outside the house. I wonder what this is turning out to be. Did our witch run away or change her address? Frank looked at Lisa. She's changed her place. That's right, a con artist. And not a stupid one at that. What do we do? Frank, how do we find her? Well, there's not a lot of options. We can wait for a call from the artist. We could talk to your mom again and go to her place, but apparently she's already changed her number and disappeared. Lisa realized that Frank was right. The con artist had thought of everything and the chances of finding her were very slim. She had to talk to her mom again. So Lisa went to see her, Frank went with her, the visit was unexpected. Vanessa, having survived an unpleasant night with smoke and herbs, rescued herself with Emily. After all, something had to be done. Protection from evil eye and spoilage was needed as soon as possible. Emily's reply dumbfounded Vanessa. The witch wrote that she had done a reading in the cards. Foreshadow danger. A close person conceived evil. And the inheritance is to blame. All the spoils are likely to be inflicted on her by a relative, and soon he will show himself. Vanessa clutched at her heart. She didn't have many relatives, and she didn't socialize with anyone. 
the closest was her daughter. But how could this be? Surely she couldn't have done the spell. Vanessa was confused. Thoughts were born in her head, and one was crazier than the other. Everything seemed possible. Suddenly Lisa appears on the doorstep with a young man. From the doorstep, they start making a fuss. Lisa asks about the witch. Vanessa tries to explain that the woman who Vanessa paid for magical services, a fraud. Vanessa is unwilling to listen to anything. Lisa, stop trying to talk this woman down. She helped me a lot, shouted Vanessa. Mom, wake up, you're being lied to. You've changed so much these weeks, it's like you've been replaced. Lisa almost cried and tried to explain, but her mother didn't want to believe, didn't want to hear. So Frank just forcibly took Lisa away. The argument was useless. As Frank drove Lisa home, she was silent, occasionally wiping away a tear. She wasn't screaming or hysterical. Just Campanella froze. Her face expressed no sadness, nothing. Frank didn't know what to say either. Didn't want to make things worse. He felt like a dog catcher right now. One wrong word, and the explosion would be unavoidable. The evening of sunset power was drowning in pink clouds. They lay on the city, stretched heavenly roads, and above, the sky was frozen like a pearl blue canvas. Here and there flashed sparks of tiny stars, and in the very center, hovered a young country month below the road rumbled. The cars were rushing into the endless distance. A little more, and a streetlight lit up the path. Vanessa couldn't find a place to go. Andrew came in from the store, didn't recognize his wife. Her hair was almost standing on end. She tried to call Emily, but she wasn't picking up. Vanessa, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Andrew put the bags in the hallway, and nothing's happening. Emily canceled the meeting, and I don't have protection. She said she's sending me the amulet. You see, she's looking for a new place to rent because it's being remodeled. What am I supposed to do? I got demons all over me, and she's Vanessa. Come on, I made you some tea to calm you down. I picked it myself. Every blade of grass is good for you. Andrew ran to the kitchen, fussed over Vanessa's dishes, sorted out the bags, put the food on the shelf in the refrigerator. Then her favorite halva caught her eye, and her heart sorely defended her. She took this sweet bar, a box, and sat down at the table. How delicious is this halva? Oh, thank you, Andrew. Vanessa sliced samples and savored, covering her eyes. Andrew poured her a hard-boiled sedative. He took kefir from the refrigerator. Have a good appetite, Vanessa. Andrew said something strange. But Vanessa turned on the TV. The presenter was muttering some news, and Vanessa only shook her head at the bread. Bitter tea, but with halva and everything went down a treat. Vanessa kept watching and watching. There was nothing new in the news. Finally, she stopped at the Coulter Channel. Swan Lake was on. The music was of a marvelous ballerina on thin legs, fluttering over the stage. Vanessa wanted to say something to Andrew, but suddenly realized he wasn't in the kitchen. There was a broken glass on the table. Andrew. Vanessa called out, but there was no answer. Did he just disappear into thin air? Vanessa went to look for him. For some reason, the corridor was skewed. Vanessa couldn't walk straight. The laminate floorboards were humped, and the walls arched. Vanessa called for Andrew, but he didn't answer. He wasn't in the bathroom. There was a black, lacquered grand piano in the living room, too, instead of a table, and it was playing a tune from Swan Lake. Finally, Vanessa went into the bedroom, but it was not her spouse who was there. There was a monster with its head in the bedroom, and it pounced on her. Vanessa screamed, fighting off the clean paws. Music was playing loudly in the kitchen. A black swan appeared on the stage to the ominous chords. Breaking free, she ran out into the hallway. But the floor beneath her feet danced like sea waves, and Vanessa crawled on her knees to the door, screaming and wailing, and she started banging on all the doors. At her screams, the neighbors came out, but Vanessa saw that their faces were distorted with anger. They were pulling in their ugly hands towards her. 
She didn't understand what was being said to her. The demons seemed to surround her. She screamed, help, help, the demons. They want to kill me. God save me. My sinful soul howled Vanessa. Andrew called an ambulance. Vanessa was taken away with paranoid psychosis. The neighbors were shocked by what they saw. Because Vanessa was so calm, so friendly, who'd have thought she'd go crazy? They reread and went to bed. Andrew stayed alone in the apartment. In the morning, he called Lisa to tell her that Vanessa had been taken to the hospital. Lisa was nearly devastated by the news. Andrew also tried to explain his reasons to her in a very rambling way. Lisa suspected something wrong. She tried to reassure herself. Inside, everything was turning upside down. The ground was shifting out from under her feet. She didn't go to work. She couldn't go to the hospital either. The psychiatric ward was closed to the public. She called Frank. Telling everything that had happened, she voiced that she suspected Andrew as well, since the contacts of the fraud had gotten to her mom from him. Frank, not thinking long, suggested Lisa to follow her stepmother. After all, it's the best way to see if Lisa's suspicions are justified. I'm engaged with the camera work and the system. But that, as they say, is sub. I'll bring everything tonight. But I need Andrew to leave. He said he was going to the country house. He's got some errands to run. And I've arranged that I'll come to water the flowers, because there are a lot of them, and it takes time to take care of them. I'm afraid I'll have to stay in my old room. I've got the keys. I'll take my laptop and a few things. I'll meet you at nine then. Andrew should be gone by then. Lisa felt an inner trepidation. She was afraid to be alone in that apartment, but she wanted to sort things out. In the evening, they met in the driveway. Frank had snatched a very heavy bag. He looked like an ant that had taken on too much weight. The intelligence agent had arrived. Frank equaled Lisa and reported with a stomp of his foot. Lisa laughed. His face was red with exertion, but his sense of humor was intact. The agent laughed. Let's go. Let's not draw attention to your scores. They went up to the second floor. Lisa was fiddling with the key. The door was a little hard to open. She hadn't opened it in a long time. She'd forgotten the doggy lock was tricky. You can't open it just like that. They walked into a dark corridor. In the gloom, glimpses of the villa on the wall, barely visible. Frank noticed it and dropped his bag and went to look. Lisa, close the door. Don't turn on the light yet. I noticed something unusual. Lisa shut the door. It had gone completely dark. The only silence was the humming of the refrigerator and the monotonous ticking of the wall clock. Lisa, come here. Look, there's traces of phosphorus cheese and more paint. Apparently water is soluble. Since it was washed away, erased the traces all over the wall sea. Frank jabbed his finger at the dimly glowing divots. Lisa took a closer look and indeed the whole wall was in a drip and fake ate noticeable glow. You're right. The wall itself is painted with a durable paint, so it's washable. And someone wrote or painted on it and then washed it off. That's terrible. Who would do that? Maybe Andrew himself. Maybe he didn't. I think the camera idea is a good one. It's a shame they didn't think of it sooner. But a good idea comes afterward. Frank flipped the switch on the chandelier, illuminating the hallway. Lisa opened her room. Everything in it was the same as before. She'd moved out of her mom's. Five years ago, there had been a glass bed, a rose closet, and a computer desk. The monitor filled up. The system unit appeared, also stood despondently downstairs, but the chandelier shone properly with all the bulbs. Lissa did not indulge in reminiscing, but she felt the past stirring somewhere in the back of her mind. Even the smell in the room was the same. Frank began to install the system. Everything had to be done as neatly and discreetly as possible. They didn't put cameras only in the bathroom and toilet. It was barely done by nightfall. Everything went to work. Colorful pots, pictures, shelves of books. After a little tinkering, Frank started debugging the hardware on Lisa's laptop. Deep past midnight, she fell powerlessly asleep. 
but Frank stocked up on coffee and worked manfully. In the morning, he finished everything and fell asleep on the couch in the living room. The night was over and the morning was overcast. Rain drummed on the windowsill. Large puddles stacked on the asphalt. A fog lay over the city. Lisa woke up the first moment. She couldn't realize where she was. She sat down on the bed and wiped her eyes with her palms. She wanted to fall on the cold pillow and forget herself. She didn't feel any more energized during the night. Then she remembered Frank. Where had he gone? Lisa quietly slid off the bed springs. The unit clanked unhappily. Carefully, stepping over the cold laminate flooring, Lisa regretted forgetting at home slippers had to put on cherry guest slippers in the hallway. They were a little too big for her and were about to fly off her foot. Lisa walked past the living room, then turned around and looked into the room, half hanging six from the couch as Frank slept. Lisa didn't bother beating him up and went into the kitchen. Everything here was unknown to her. She looked for tea on the shelf, and there were many jars, different teas. They all had their own labels on them. Vanessa's mom didn't drink tea from tea bags on principle, only fresh overboiled. There were cans of tea, fruit assortment, clown sedative, like a tea stall. Lisa sighed and took a tea. The mysterious teapot was empty. All the cups were on the shelf in an even row. Lisa pulled out a mug with colorful cats on it. She had given it to her mother for March 8th. Frank chose a blue cup with a Mediterranean pattern. After putting the cups in the kettle, she decided to do an audit of the refrigerator. But it was almost empty. It was as if a hurricane had blown through. Only jars of jam stood, sad, and in the farthest corner of the shelves, and a small saucepan. Lisa sighed sadly. This was strange. Mom always has a full fridge. She cooks every day. And here it was empty. After all, she was unexpectedly hospitalized, and the groceries had nowhere to go. Lisa thought it was a rumor. She looked in the freezer. Everything was the same as it had been before. Cookies, cutlets, dumplings. The freezer was full of food. She was distracted from her thoughts by Frank. He stood at the entrance to the kitchen, yawning furiously. His eyes were red and puffy. But what breakfast are we having? He asked. Lisa pulled out a bag of dumplings and rattled the packet. I think I'll have dumplings and tea. The fridge is empty. Apparently Andrew had taken the groceries to the villa. Dumplings are the food of the gods. It's a great way to start the day. Frank, staggering, disappeared into the bathroom. Lisa took out a large skillet and put it on the gas. The bottle of oil was next to the stove, but the spices were still to be found. Pulling out drawer after drawer in turn, she found a stack of bagged paper towel rolls, pipe cleaner, and dishwashing detergent. Finally, she found forks, spoons, and spices dumped into the hot oil the entire package of dumplings. She leaped from the stove like a knight, putting the glass lid forward like a shield. The dumplings were sewn into the body of the oil, started spitting hot splashes in different directions. It was scary to approach the stove, but Frank came to the rescue. He carefully took the spoon and lid from Lisa. Let a professional do the work. You can rest for a while. Lisa obediently sat down at the tables turned on the TV. The volume was at maximum. Lisa clamped her ears shut. Frank crouched down in surprise at the quirks of the sound being turned down to minimum. Lisa looked at Frank at how loud it was. Who's looking at the TV? Can you stall at that sound? I was scared. She wrinkled her nose in discomfort. No one's watching. It's either accidentally pressed or on purpose. Like to scare you. For example, I just had a close call with Conrad. The effect is unbelievable. Frank held on to his heart, leaning back in his chair. What other surprises will there be? We have to be on the lookout. I don't really want to stay here now, but there's no choice. We'll take the bait. When Frank left, Lisa locked herself in her room. She sat on her bed and looked at the monitor. All the cameras were working properly. Nothing was happening. Out of boredom, she went to check. The violet racks stood with the lights on. It was on timed. The flowers had cable watering. 
and so far so good. Lisa ran her hand over the fluffy leaves, velvety like a cat's paws. She liked violets since she was a little girl. Then she decided to watch the bedroom. The bed was shot, clean carpet everywhere without a speck of dust. A huge closet with glass doors was wall to wall. It had a picture of a beautiful mountain landscape on it. That's where the clothes were stored. Lissa pushed one of the doors open. Inside smelled like her mother's perfume, and there were dresses, pants, and coats hanging. Downstairs were boxes of shoes. A fur coat was stored in a case. Lisa opened the other casement. It was half empty. There should have been all those Andrew things in there. But besides his wedding suit, there was an old jacket and a couple of ties hanging there. But on the shelves were his things, a sweater, jeans. It smelled like heavy perfume and masculine. Then Lisa hastily closed the closet. There was an earpiece on the dresser at the headboard of the bed. The phone charger lay in a box against the wall. Nothing. Suspicious, though Lisa saw his needles next to the bed. They were crumbling on the carpet. Lisa crouched down to examine them and noticed bags sticking out from under the bed. He couldn't be seen behind the covers. Lisa pulled out a large bag. It contained some leftover herbs at the bottom. What had Emily sent? Among the new items was a piece of paper describing the ritual and how the herbs were to be burned. Lisa grabbed the package and ran to her room. She took a picture of the entire herbarium and the note. Then she twisted that bag tightly and stowed it in the alcove of her closet where the bar came off. That was her secret place. There she hid cigarettes and money. Mom had no idea about the icy stash. All the photos were sent to Frank. He said he'd try to identify the plants, but since they're dry, it would be a challenge. Lisa had to take a week off work to continue her investigation, and she wanted to spend that time as productively as possible. But for two days, nothing happened. Lisa searched up and down the place. When she got unbearably bored, she decided to go for a walk. It was warm, crowded. She was able to forget her anxiety for a while. But back home, the anxiety came home. Suddenly, Andrew returned. Lisa saw his bag and her heart pounded harder. She didn't trust him and didn't know how to behave properly. They hadn't talked much, so Lisa decided to play dumb. He might think she could be fooled just like her mother. Lisa dismounted and quietly snuck into her room. She had a separate key for that. She had put the lock on when she found out that her mother had decided to remarry. She didn't want a stranger touching her things. Vanessa didn't mind. After all, the room was personal space, and the other four were quite enough for her. Lisa went straight to look at the cameras. Andrew was in the bedroom. He was packing his suitcase with his belongings from the shelves. His movements were abrupt. He was visibly nervous and was texting someone on the phone. Lisa wondered, what is he hiding? But how to find out? The plan came quickly. Lisa decided to order a food delivery. She chose pizza. Corny, yes, but everyone loves pizza. 45 minutes later, the doorbell rang. Andrew got up and went to the door. Lisa slipped through the crack like a mouse. Her phone was at the ready. Andrew left his phone on the dresser. Lisa saw a new message from Camille pop up on the screen. Who the hell is Camille? Lisa thought. Opening the message, she took a few pictures of the correspondence without looking and also slipped out of the bedroom into the stairwell. In raised tones, the pizza delivery man and Andrew were communicating. Lisa took pity on the delivery man and walked out. When Andrew saw her, he turned pale. Lisa paid for the pizza. Lisa, where did you come from? I thought you were eating violets and leaving. I'm sorry, did I scare you? It's a long drive, so I thought I'd stay in my room for a while. I'll keep an eye on the flowers. Lisa was cradling boxes of warm pizza. Will you be having dinner? She asked politely. Andrew wanted to refuse at first, but after thinking about it, he agreed. The smell was very appetizing. Yes, I'll be right there. Go to the kitchen. He threw over his shoulder, heading for the bedroom. Lissa walked unsteadily into the kitchen. Opening the pizza, she took two plates and put them on the table. Andrew entered the kitchen. 
His face was red now. He looked like a boiled crawfish with a puffy mustache. His bald spot on his head seemed to be smoking. He'd obviously just been cursing and was trying to force himself back inside. Lisa put herself a couple slices of pizza, but didn't feel like eating at all, especially in such company. Andrew, on the other hand, changed the relaxed cheese, writing off his mustache gloves. Melissa had made quite an impression on him. He coughed, but was clearly enjoying himself. Lisa, as she looked on, inadvertently choked began to cough and spat a piece on the table, wiping away snot and tears. Andrew saw this and offered tea. You be careful, where are you in a hurry? To be quiet. I'll be right back. I'll make some tea. It's good for the nerves. Lissa noticed a cup of tea in front of her. It smelled strongly of syringe and mint. Andrew smiled. I'm breathing now. What's the tea with? I think it smells like syringe. Lisa sniffed the cup. Yes, yes, there's Melissa's nonsense in there. Strawberry leaves Street John's wart. Anything from the woods that's useful. Andrew didn't look at Lisa and mentioned pizza. Lisa tasted the tea. It was bitter and nasty, but she didn't let on. Did you call the clinic as a mom? Lisa asked, trying to catch Andrew's gaze. He tensed. Called, they said Vanessa is doing better. She's in therapy. If everything is fine, she'll be discharged soon. That's good. Can you give me the number? I'll make the call. Is there anything you need to bring in? Yeah, I've got you down for tea and beer and let's go. I'm dictating. I've got it in my notebook. Andrew made sure Lisa drank her tea, but she didn't want to. So she pretended the tea was very hot and came loudly. It went like this. They sat for about 30 minutes. Then a tune started playing in the bedroom. Andrew got up from the table with a strained smile and left. Lisa remained sitting in silence. She did not drink tea. Standing up from the table, she noticed that she felt a little dizzy and sat back down. She took a few sips. There must have been something in the tea besides Melissa. There was a reason Andrew had brewed it, and Lisa clutched the edge of the kitchen corner. What to do? Lisa thought. She was scared. This way the tea is hardly poisoned. I'm going to die, but I need to get to the room and lock it. Fumbled for the key in her hand. She clutched it like a lifeline, stood up slowly, and walked down the wall. The ceiling and what seemed to be chandeliers wobbled. The floor began to fuse together, and saints appeared on it. Lissa couldn't believe her eyes. This isn't real, it's tea. She repeated in her head pour by pour. As she dismounted from her room, she saw a silhouette at the end of the hallway. Andrew was there. His glasses glinted ominously. He seemed impossibly huge. Lisa lunged into the room and slammed the door shut, but she managed to lock herself in. Doors were pushed from the other side. She realized she had to act and piled on it as hard as she could, pushing with her legs. A hand appeared in the opening. She tried to fumble for a tear. She screamed and hit the hand with the clutched key. A scolding was heard and the hand disappeared. Lisa had enough time to lock herself in the room. Her head was spinning. She emerged until she was sitting on the bed, but immediately the door was swinging shut. Andrew was trying to break the lock. He was saying something, swearing, but in Lisa's ears it was an unintelligible hum. She started trying to text Frank, but then a stinking smoke drifted into the room. Lisa stopped banging on the door. Staggering, she started to open the window wide open. Opening the windows, she breathed in the clean air. Finally, she was able to dial Frank. Frank, I've been poisoned, I think. I don't know where it's real and where it's crazy. Andrew seems to be breaking into my room and there's smoke, but I don't know if it's real or not. Now the chandelier is wobbling like an earthquake and there's a black blot creeping across the closet. I'm scared. Lissa lay down on the windowsill and closed her eyes. It was easier not to look. It made it easier for me to call the ambulance police. Do what? Frank was agitated. Lisa heard his voice from far away, as if underwater. No, you have to get there before Andrew escapes. 
I'm sure he's involved. He's packing. Lisa inhaled a deeper breath of air and slid to the floor. She seemed to be lying on the waves, and they rolled higher. Out of sight, the blue sky shone brightly with the sun, and the wind carried the cries of seagulls. She woke up to the noise of someone banging forcefully on the door. Lisa sat down on the floor with an effort. Her hair was blowing in the breeze and the smell of cherry blossoms wafted from the street. Lisa rubbed her eyes, trying to banish the cloudy veil. Her head grimaced. It seemed to be pulled by an iron hoop. The voice outside the door was familiar to her. It was Frank. Lisa started leaning on the windowsill and staggered to the door. The key remained stuck in the keyhole, and with obedient hands, she turned it one turn. Opening the door, she staggered. Andrew stood on the threshold. Frank's voice was in the receiver of the phone. Andrew pulled Lisa out of the room by the arm. The door slammed its draft. Silently, he led her into the bedroom. There were papers on the bed. Lisa said cold, clammy fear. Andrew sat her down on the edge with force. Did you look? Here's the deal. I wanted to be amicable and non-violent. You sign the papers that you give up rights to your share of the apartment, writes out the highway to your studio, and everybody lives happily ever after. Your mother signed the sale papers, and $120,000 was transferred into the account. The apartment is sold. I'm registered here, and now it's my property. But you, my dear, I don't need you here. You see, my dove is not visual. Andrew ingratiatingly and coldly explained to Lisa his motives. He was a snake that good Vanessa had taken to heart. How could you? Forced Lisa. Baby, sign it. Vanessa, I've got a crush on her. A dream, not a wife. But boring. I'm being nice to her. She'll be in the hospital for a month, and then she'll move on. She could have gone to the cemetery. Sign it. I don't like rudeness. Andrew moved the papers to Lisa and put a pen in front of her. Lisa realized that if this man didn't sign, he could do anything. With a trembling hand, she signed the papers. Andrew deftly wrote them out and patted Lisa on the head. What a good girl, but not to me. You have an apartment and you'll get married. I'm not taking your villa. I'm being kind. Nothing personal, just business. Do you know how low academic salaries are? Andrew packed his things, packed his documents in a suitcase. And thanks to the naive Babenko, I'll open my own business, live for myself. After all, the main thing is that you have to love a woman and she will turn your soul out. Andrew left the bedroom. The front door slammed. Lysa fell on the pillow and howled with hopelessness, fear, and self-pity. Some time passed and she grew tired calm down. She just lay there, listening, the wall clock flowing in the window, batting for a fly. She could not find her way out of the magazine the streets of freedom were before her. But what could a little fly do? Lysa sat up on the bed, and there might still be more. There was a laptop computer in the room. Was the footage from the camera still being recorded? Lysa wiped her face on the shelf and pillows and went into the room. The lock was skewed and it wouldn't open. All she did was yank the knob in vain. Just then, the front door slammed and Frank appeared on the doorstep. He was running. He couldn't catch his breath. His excitement subsided. He saw Lisa alive. In three steps, he approached and hugged her tightly, just kept silent. She could hear his heart pounding hard. She nakedly relaxed, became, finally, calm, safe. The door closed. We need all the footage from the cameras. Frank, I was right. Andrew, cheater, he set the whole thing up. Lysa was determined. She felt empowered. Now it was time to act. Frank opened the doors only harder with his shoulder, the key falling to the laminate floor with a clatter. The laptop had recorded everything from the cameras. They had proof. Lisa had also collected all the tea to take to forensics. They filed a report the same day, but it was as if Andrew's footprints had vanished. I had to find Emily, or maybe her name was really Camille. After all, Andrew had been corresponding with an unknown woman. A few days passed, 
the results of the tests came back. Almost all the tea was poisonous in small doses, powers, and were jeweled and composed in a competent manner. They were unlikely to kill, but they did cause hallucinations. Long sleeps could, with regular use, drive one insane. Having obtained a doctor's report, Lisa proved that there were traces of psychotropic substances in her mother's blood. Vanessa's mother underwent a course of drips and felt well again. But Lisa didn't immediately to tell her mother why she needed to get into a confusing situation with the apartment and Andrew needed time to maneuver. A week later, Lisa got a call from the painter. He was, alas, torturing his son. To whom had he rented the place in his absence? It turned out, while his father was recovering, the son decided to make a joke, but there wasn't enough money. Suddenly, he met a lady named Camille. The lady immediately paid him $1,000 for a month. All he had was a cell phone and her photo. Thanks to this data, Camille was quickly found. She turned out to be an actress in some small theater. She made money off of gullible people by providing fortune telling and healing services. She'd known Andrew for five years. He used to send rich clients to her, and she used to indoctrinate them with his fantasies, spoils, hexes, and other problems. She was spinning herself to absurdity. She made good money on them, but she had to give a percentage. Andrew was a good psychologist. He used Camille as a tool, too. She felt special. Once they found Camille, the police were in no hurry to find Andrew, and the apartment was officially his. It had already been sold through third parties. Lissa didn't know what else to do. While she pondered, she decided to call her father. There's no such thing as ex-military. He still worked for the state, but as a special training instructor. He lived in a private house. She had already planned to call on May Day, and so it had coincided quite well. After congratulating her father, she paused. I need help. You know that I do everything. I don't ask for money or favors myself. But things are bad now. The con man took my mom and I's apartment, and my mom's still in the hospital. He poisoned her, and the police can't find him. And the apartment is for sale. Dad listened in silence. Over the years, he had learned to listen carefully and not to throw emotions around. His temper had already gotten him bloody. He sighed. You've made a mess of things. I'll make a call. The phone buzzed. Lisa stood listening to them. She wanted to hear something else, but her father wasn't saying much. She decided if he said it, he would call. The wait began to stretch unbearably long, like a long earthworm wrestling with a stubborn thrush. And Lisa waited. Andrew had been found. He was to be flown to New York. Lisa and Frank began to prepare for the trial. But despite her father's support, the case dragged on. More and more stories of the scam came to light. As Andrew said, he was very fond of Vanessa. His previous victims had succumbed to long ago damp ground. They were elderly, single, and very wealthy. The case had grown such a coat over the year that Lisa was tired of waiting for retribution. The apartment was recovered sooner. The lawyers had been very helpful, but Vanessa did not dare to return to it. Memories frightened her. Everything reminded her of nightmares. Only violets, the flowers that were dear to her heart, remained her outlet. They sold the apartment for a very large sum. Vanessa moved into a private house with all the comforts of home and her own conservatory. It may be small, but her palm tree found its place there. The violet business continued. Lisa and Frank helped to set up the new shelving space. Vanessa's life began to settle down again. She got a cat, a fat blue Brit with aristocratic manners, and a huge head. The cat had almost the full force of a woman's love and was hiding under the racks. But when Massimo called him, the cat lived like cheese and butter. He knew how to please Vanessa. Every night before she went to bed, he sang her songs, stomped on the plate and meowed. At night he protected her sleep. She never had nightmares. One day the cat brought in a huge mouse. All morning he guarded it under the neighbor's shed. The cat howled proudly carrying the trophy. Vanessa was sitting in the arbor, parsing violet leaves. Suddenly, she heard a pleasant male voice, A handsome. 
What kind of cat? A real hunter. And you steps and steps, howling like a husser. Vanessa even began to see who it was that was so praising her cat. A neighbor came to the villa. He, leaning on the wooden fence, watched the cat. The cat is your prey to the mistress, and the tan man watched him with delight. This is Marquez. We are a British cat. He is a good hunter, Vanessa said proudly. The cat is a marvel. I haven't been here for a long time, and there's a cat with mice under the barn. You're new here, aren't you? My name's Nick. The neighbor stood under the apple tree like Apollo in a plaid shirt. Nice to meet you. I'm Vanessa. I've been living here for a few months now. Vanessa, would you like to grill a steak tonight? It's my birthday tonight. I'm on vacation. Finally, the freedom of life. I don't mind in principle, but only with the cat. Vanessa looked at the meat. He did not live, sitting in the grass under the rays of the sun. His fur coat glistened like a mink coat. Of course, he's invited too. I'm expecting you. Vanessa sat down at the table to sort out the violets. It's good to have a cat like that. Life is getting better. In the summer, life changed for the daughter. Lisa received an offer from Frank. They decided they would have a very nice wedding. But first won the court luck, and Lisa's father was on the side of justice and clutching a folder of documents. She came out the winner. It was all in the past. Andrew relied on forensic video evidence to prove his guilt. Neither Vanessa nor Lisa saw him again. Finally, it was possible to breathe fully. Lisa and Frank arrived at Vanessa's new home. The large apple orchard was a nice addition to the house. Young apple trees stood, all studded with different varieties of apples. There was emerald grass everywhere you looked. Lisa was lounging on the recliner, eating cherries. There was a huge basin of berries in front of them. She watched her Frank help her neighbor Nick with the grill. The men were determined to try to build a fire. Vanessa and the cat were enjoying the warm summer. The cat was lying to himself in the sunshine, and Vanessa was relaxing on the swing under the apple tree. It was about to ripen.